So could I invite Andrew, Dido, and Natalie to the stage here? We don't have much time. If I could steal five minutes, uh, so we'll have about seven or eight minutes for one round of questions uh, for our excellent speakers. And I just wonder where any questions from the audience, I'm going to restrict myself asking any questions. Any questions from the audience? And probably we'll pair them in three. Any questions? Hands up. Yeah, we have three already up. Let's start with the lady. Thank you. Hi, Heather Pinches from NHS Digital. Um, it's a question for Natalie, really, about... Um, yeah, I think it's interesting you've managed to raise the level of the debate, which I think is really helpful in getting some, some wider views on this. But what is the role of individual choice as part of that kind of transparency um, agenda? Thank you. We'll take two other questions, and then we will... Is the first question to, to Natalie. Yep. Yeah. Yes, please, the gentleman in the back and the lady behind him. Um, it's both a question and a plea, so initially... Just tell us who you are, sir. Uh, sorry, yeah. Brian Dean at the AP, ABPI, the, the Industry Association. Thank you. Uh, when we talk internationally, we like to talk about the UK, um, and inherently that would be 65 million people. Um, it, it's a plea that we are clear when we talk about initiatives, whether we're actually talking about the UK or whether we're not including the devolved nations, because I've spent a lot of time in the last six months looking at this and some in initiatives claim to be UK and aren't um, and I think it, uh, at the moment there's an element of the devolved nations being a symptom of the fragmentation almost. Thank you. The lady behind? Hi. Yeah, we'll come back. Um, Eleanor Horwich, Director of Research at Reform. Um, some of you mentioned I guess quite high hopes as to the you know role of NHSX in kind of helping to set standards and so on. Um, and I guess my question to you is how realistic do you think that is given that they do not have any legal footing to really set standards as they're not a statutory body? Thank you very much. So, Natalie, could we start with you on the choice? Could we have a microphone here? Oh, there's one here. Okay, no problem. I hope I'm able to switch this on. Is it on? Uh, thanks very much. So on that question around individual choice, I think it, it is a great question. You know, we do have the national data opt-out. I think we should be really clear about what it does and doesn't apply to. It's actually fairly limited, especially if you're starting to think about removing identifying information from that data to be able to use it for other purposes. The, the opt-out may not apply in that case. So I think we need to be much clearer with people about what their level of choice is is in practice. The other thing I'd say about individual choice is, um, and, and I, it, it, we explicitly didn't go there in this particular jury, but I think it's really important to, to talk about, is we often hear this, this, this argument that, look, all of this stuff sounds great, but I can't get hold of my own data. My GP can't get hold of the stuff from, from my uh, you know, specialist and so on. So why on earth should anyone else use it? If I can't get hold of it, why should anybody else? And I think that speaks to two points. One is, I think a question around fairness. Why aren't we putting more time and effort into allowing patients to have access to their own data? Um, and secondly, it speaks to the skepticism point, which is you really think you can do this because you can't even get it right for me individually. I think we could do a huge amount to make the case for, uh, the, for the investment, for the, for the research uses of this data, if we give patients more capacity to be able to hold and see and access and use their own information to help them manage their own healthcare conditions. You, you would go a huge way towards uh, to demystifying this data, actually, if people could see it themselves and use it for themselves. And then they're far more likely to say, well, actually, yeah, no, it does seem reasonable that other people can, can use this as well, but I need it for myself uh, in the first instance. So I think that, for me, that feels like the role of individual choice. I think there is a, a broader, longer-term question around the opt-out on whether that might need revision and updating in light of of the huge changes that are, that are happening in, in this space. Thank you very much. I suspect, Andrew, coming from a devolved nation, you should be asking, answering the second question, and then probably I'll ask Dido to address the third one. Yeah. So, so firstly, we are a United Kingdom. Um, secondly, we mustn't allow the fact that uh, uh, science is reserved and health is devolved to conspire against us. Um, Thirdly, a thought is if this is an international challenge, as I, I hope I convinced you, if the UK is going to play a, a, the international leading role in this, 
we have an obligation to work in partnership across the UK. So certainly HDR UK is a UK, and every hub has four nation, um, uh, no, not, no, all the hubs have four nation representation, and we are working in partnership with NHS Wales, NHS Scotland, Northern Ireland, great they've got a new government, and NHS England. And I think it's, it, let's really make a statement, this is UK wide. If I understand so, correct, there's a lot of co-learning from the devolved nations because Scotland was well ahead of the game and there's a lot of uh, opportunities of learning from each other. Yeah, there's, there's huge opportunities to, uh, to, yeah. to learn. There's great stuff happening in Wales. There's, there's good social and healthcare integration in Northern Ireland. Yeah. So uh, in this space, I think we should all commit to it. It's a UK endeavor. Thank you. Dido, would you tackle the last one? Why should we be optimistic about NHSX? Uh, well, firstly, I'm inherently optimistic, so I find it quite hard not to be. But uh, I, let me describe the world I've come from. So I've come from a sector in telecoms where every telecoms company in, in this country is a competitor, a supplier, and a customer of each other. And while it's a commercial, there's no public ownership, there's no statutory power for anyone, um, telcos, not just in this country, but globally, collaborate to set standards. So I think it's a mistake to believe that in the digital world, setting standards is about having legal um, power. It's about bu building collaborative consensus. And it's a skill set that we need much, much more within the NHS. Uh, and, and, and it's sort of the irony that it's, it's actually the core to academic work as well. Um, so I'm optimistic because actually, if you look at the um, parents of NHSX, um, the departments uh, of health and social care and NHSE and I, actually between us, we have all of the levers of power and influence to affect change if we choose to all work together on it. And if we choose to engage the important stakeholders in setting these standards, both in clinical care and in research. So I'm optimistic because actually that's how you lead in the digital world. It's not a healthcare-specific leadership challenge. It's actually a digital era leadership challenge that resorting to sort of mum and dad to set the legal rules doesn't work. You actually have to bring people with you. Thank you, Dado. So we'll do one, one, one last round. Three questions as well. There's a lady there and the gentleman beside there. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, Monica Fletcher from the Breathe Hub. Uh, Natalie, and actually you've all been talking about parents here and uh, I, I, you've, you left your point about sustainability and about, you know, this is a future for our children. Well, the genie is out of the box when it comes to data now. And, and I just wondered how much your engagement did involve young people. We've seen what young people have done to influence the environmental agenda. So I, I'd be really interested to know if you haven't, what your plans are for the future because it's their future. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning. Hi, Richard Dormer from Insignia. Um, Andrew, I'm, um, I understand what you say about using data internationally, and I think that's wonderful. And we hear about companies that are uh, having 300,000 people who are curating data. But where do we sit with um, using data collaboratively, and, and in the UK using data, which may have been collected at a standard that doesn't adhere to what we're trying to do here with, with, um, with all the transparency. Because there may well be some great data out there, but it may not have been collected to the same level as us with consent. Thank you. Any last question? No? Right, Natalie, kids. Kids, fantastic we know question. More about data sharing than yes. we do. Yes. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic question. Um, this particular piece of work um, involved people uh, 18 to 64. Um, for the, for the sake of getting the, the, the sampling and so on. Um, but I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think we need to sort of counter this assumption that young people don't care about privacy, which seems to be a, a certain generation think, oh, well, they, they put everything on social media, they don't, they don't care about this. That, I think, is completely false. Um, from the limited amount of research that we have exploring attitudes at, at different age ranges, actually young people, uh, A, get, get the way that this data could be used more quickly and get the benefits, but also they're more concerned to ensure that they have some degree of control or choice. So much more used to 
a world of privacy settings, for example. Um, and I think it would be, I think it's going to be very, very important to, to do that work. Um, we're really keen to explore particularly young people's views more in relation to health data use. We're at the moment a team of three. So, you know, we've got big plans and actually young people is definitely one of them. So sort of watch this space for, for work on that. But I'd be really keen to, uh, to, to collaborate and work with others on potential ways that we can identify whether there's particular issues, concerns that differ from the wider population in young people. Any views about the ethics of using sources of data that may not be legitimate or ethical? Um, so um, our work with HDR UK and all the hubs is all uh, advised to the legal framework of the United Kingdom. Um, I, I think there are two issues here, and we had an alliance board meeting yesterday, and it was great because we're starting to see uh, how we can improve the data that are already out there. And to be honest, there's a kaleidoscope of quality, if I put it that way. Uh, what's also clear is that metadata matters, and we need to be, be much more uh, astute about how we catalog data and use metadata and automate metadata definition. So I think there's a big issue around data quality. The, 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 the other issue is around trustworthy use of data and setting up systems which ensure with, with public engagement that we are using data for, uh, in a trustworthy way. And that's why we're really taken by the ONS five safes because it's multiple concurrent safeguards. So accredited researchers asking questions that are approved in a safe environment, less data travel is a good thing. Uh, on anonymized or de-identified data with, with safe outputs in terms of statistical disclosure control. So I think we have an opportunity to establish these safeguarded systems with multiple concurrent safeguards in play. Consent goes alongside anonymization and authorization for a trustworthy way of how to um, uh, approve use of these data. So, um, so I think there is an opportunity, but designing the system so it's safeguarded is absolutely key. Thank you. Any last words from you, Dido, being the chair of the largest health system in the world? <laughs> Maybe I'd just like to comment on the children's piece because I know a bit about that from Child Internet Safety, which is uh, young people are so much better at speaking truth to power. And so if we have the courage to hear, actually they will almost always tell us the direction we need to go in. Um, so it's brilliant. It's a brilliant question and I think we need to do more. And, and I think there is something that NHS England and NHS Improvement can learn from all of you who are working in this space because actually I think that, and I've seen it in the last two months with Genomics England, I think that those of you uh, data scientists working with patients and citizens are leading the way in how the NHS could change the way we hear and listen more directly to the people who use our services. So actually I come away hugely optimistic having listened to Natalie that we need to bring it into the non-digital part of the NHS as well. Thank you. Could I ask you all to thank firstly uh, John for opening the session and obviously Dido, Andrew and Natalie, thanks for a wonderful session. <laughs>